the Minnesota Historical Society. Welcome to Knowing Our Worth, Black Women Changemakers, a conversation with Dr. Josie R. Johnson, Ms. Anika Bowie, Hennepin County Commissioner Angela Connolly, moderated by Dr. Duchess Harris. This is the second in a three-part series featuring women who have been at the vanguard of social and political change. In this, a year when we are marking both the centennial of the 19th Amendment and a historic U.S. election in which the work of Native, Latinx, Asian, and Black women shifted the outcome, altered the makeup of governments at every level, and helped elect the first woman to the White House. We all come to today's conversation from communities that owe their existence and vitality to generations from around the world who contributed their hopes, dreams, and energy to our collective past. Some were brought here against their will, some immigrated here to ho in hope of a better life, and some have lived on this land for more generations than can be counted. We acknowledge this history by honoring the truth. The Minnesota Historical Society is located on the ancestral homelands of the Dakota people. We pay respects to their elders past and present. And as you listen to today's conversation, I hope you will consider the many legacies that have brought us together. And now it is my pleasure to introduce our moderator, Dr. Duchess Harris. She is a professor of American studies at McAllister College and a scholar of 20th century political history, civil rights, and black feminism with both a PhD in American studies and a Juris Doctorate in civil rights law from the University of Minnesota. Harris is a past recipient of the Minnesota Association of Black Lawyers Profiles in Courage Award and the author of numerous scholarly articles, essays, and books and also of books for young readers, including The Killing of George Floyd and Justice for George Floyd, which will be released next month by Abdo Publishing. Welcome, Dr. Harris. Thank you so much. Well, it's wonderful to be here this afternoon, and we might be physically distant, but we are socially connected. I want to um, extend my gratitude to Daniel Dart for inviting me to be the moderator, and I also want to acknowledge Ned Hurley for doing the technology for us today. And so I will start with introductions for this intergenerational panel. And I will start with Angela Conley. For nearly 20 years, Commissioner Conley has worked tirelessly to change systems at the macro level, both at the state and county, in ways that are holistic, person first and seamless. She received her bachelor's degree in social work from St. Catharines University and a master's degree in public administration from Hamlin University. Now she proudly serves as the first African-American elected to the Hennepin County Board. Her top priority is including the voices of our families and communities in every decision the county makes that impacts our lives. Commissioner Conley continues to focus on housing as a fundamental human right, reducing race-based disparities in Hennepin County and reforming our juvenile justice system. I will now bring on Anika Bowie. Anika Bowie is a fifth generation daughter of Rondo and a graduate of Hamlin University in criminal justice. She has deep roots in politics and social justice, in the past, she has served as chair of Restore the Vote Minnesota, regional organizing director for presidential candidate Elizabeth Warren, advisor to 40 Black women rising candidates, and as a 2019 Josie R. Johnson Fellow with the African American Leadership Forum. Bowie is currently the vice president of the Minneapolis NAACP, a board member with Smart Justice Minnesota, and the founder and executive director of Run Like Harriet, a digital startup platform that encourages unapologetic Black women to run for office. And finally, our last panelist is Dr. Josie R. Johnson. Dr. Johnson was born in Texas in 1930 and has played an active role in the civil rights movement since her teenage years, when she and her father gathered signatures on an anti-poll tax petition in her hometown of Houston, Texas. Dr. Johnson earned her BA in sociology from Fisk University and a master's and doctorate of education from the University of Massachusetts Amherst. As a veteran civil rights leader, Josie lobbied to pass Minnesota's anti-discrimination laws in 1956. She's a committed champion for fair housing, equal employment, and better educational outcomes for children. 
She taught in the African American Studies Department at the University of Minnesota, where she was later appointed to the Minnesota Board of Regents, Associate Vice President in charge of Minority Affairs and Diversity Director of the All University Forum. The recipient of numerous awards and honors, Dr. Johnson is the namesake of the annual Josie R. Johnson Human Rights and Social Justice Award established in her honor at the University of Minnesota. Well, I cannot tell you um, how delighted I am to share space with you three women today. And so this is a highlight, not just of my week, but I can admit of my career. So I will start off um, with you, Anika. And what I will say is that um, you are a part of the first generation of what I would call cyber organizers. And so in my introduction, I talked about um, your platform that was a digital startup that encourages black women to run for office. And I would like to know what it's like for your gener generation to organize using the internet. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Harris, for the question. And I you know, stand proudly as a Black woman, also as a millennial, that has a very unique you know, opportunity to where barriers was broken down. And one of those barriers that was broken down for our generation was access to be messengers, to communication. We had the digital platforms right there at our fingertips, right? So we had already access to a communication tool to where we can speak our message. And you know what we have seen in the civil rights movement and also in the black power movement was the message of the revolution will not be televised, right? And millennials, we flipped that and we made the revolution digitalized. Like we digitalized the revolution and made sure that the message that was really bold at that time in the midst of the Trayvon Martin uh, shootings, in the midst of so many people getting gunned down where we saw this extension of lynchings here in, the, in America, our message was Black Lives Matter. And we hashtagged it, we marketed it, we pushed it. And that message transcended from social media platforms all the way to where you see billboards, you see it in our businesses, you see it online, and you see it also in the hearts and the spirits of those who are in those streets, making sure that people are recognizing our humanity. It's also important to recognize that we also came through the Obama era where Obama was the most marketed campaign, presidential campaign we have ever seen in our lifetime. And that we were politicized from a, a something of hope, right? We got into this, in this organizing with hope on our minds to where we were having these conversations in our social media platforms to where we were able to transform Twitter into Black Twitter. Right to so where we see that conversation happening on a national level, to so where Facebook is now a tool that we're building community, to so where we don't have to organize in the same way of meeting up, but we have a, a, a community group, right? We um, are changing the narrative and even changing the visuals of what Black Lives Matter, what it looks like through Instagram. So it's so many different platforms that we have access to. And I think also, what's important, it gives us access and agency to be our own messengers. But with cyber organizing, we are exposed to oppression in such a way that um, can have psychological damages, right? Um, social emotional damages um, to where we have to heal uh, a nation from seeing uh, the, the most murderous act that we saw with our brother George Floyd here in Minneapolis where that was a worldwide display of, uh, of lynching that we have seen in that we had utilized all those different platforms. Do we see now with corporations having the most massive uh, marketing display of being, you know, standing together with us, um, valuing black lives, highlighting black designers, highlighting, you know, checking in with their black employees to where we've seen this um, investment 
um, with making sure we are preserving Black humanity um, on this country. So, and also in response to the murderous uh, act of Derek Chauvin and the um, three other officers here in Minnesota, what we also saw was, you know, George Floyd called out to his mother. And during that time, uh, the most horrific time was able to really muster up the courage and the hope and the perseverance and the strength and also the the boldness of encouraging black women all around but particularly here in minnesota to run for office during that time when george floyd called out for his mother black women rise to occasion and i also want to recognize alberta galepsi who was the founder of black women rising she had literally carried a, literally her 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 campaign and the campaign of so many others on her backs. We know that uh, Ken Martin, who is the uh, director of uh, the DFL, had even recognized that Black women are the backbone of the DFL party due to her work and so many others. And during that time, we had Black women rise to occasions with running for office and had transceded even uh, our social media platforms with messages of hope, giving people an opportunity to really move forward and, have, and seek political change through Black women leadership. Anika, that is outstanding. When I think about your call for unapologetic Black women to run for office, of course, that makes me think of Commissioner Conley. And so Commissioner Conley, you sit more in my generation, which is between these two generations. And so I'm curious if you can talk about what your campaign strategies were to become the first black um, commissioner for Hennepin County. You're muted, Commissioner Conley. And I am unmuted now, thank you. <laughs> I, I mean, it, it truly is an honor. And um, I want to be very clear about something, is that you can run as your unapologetic self. You don't have to concede to what you think people want to hear. Uh, one of the, the most important things that I learned in running for this seat was that when I was on the doors and speaking to residents of the 4th District of Hennepin County, which I now have the privilege to represent, I heard so many stories that were so similar to my own. I, hold, I, I heard so many stories that were so similar to those of my friends, stories of, of, of tribulation and stories of triumph and stories of, you know, here's how my family member was kept in, in jail when they didn't need to be because they couldn't afford bail. So it was really listening to the stories of people and connecting them to, you know, what it is that I stood for. And I have always, and will continue to always stand for the truth. Uh, as black women, we don't always have the opportunity to really speak our truth in a way that is unapologetic without being called out, without being, you know, considered aggressive. And, and to me, that's okay. Ultimately, what it's about is changing policy to reflect the needs of the folks who really haven't had their needs met in years, decades, centuries even. Coming into the position of county commissioner after 150 plus years of not having, uh, you know, melanated representation on the board, no black women, no other, you know, community of color represented on that board. And then realizing Hennepin County is the second largest level of government in the state. Uh, I chose to swear in uh, during my swearing in ceremony on the, on the new Jim Crow by Michelle Alexander. And it was symbolic in a couple of ways. It was symbolic in that I knew the road ahead of me meant that as a commissioner who represents one of the most de diverse districts in Hennepin County, as someone who is now in the leadership position to make changes in our Department of Corrections, to make changes in who enters our county jail. It is ultimately a responsibility of mine to ensure that people who look like me have a fair chance in this ridiculous system who has for centuries 
over incarcerated us, uh, who has for centuries racially profiled us. Uh, recently, I, along with my colleague, uh, Commissioner Fernando, wrote a resolution saying that, you know what, in Hennepin County, racism is a public health crisis. It is killing us. Racism is literally killing us. And if it wasn't for the position that I have right now, I would not have been able to move that. So I, I am humbled by the fact that voters trusted me with their vote, trusted me to speak my truth, trusted me to, to, to speak that truth to power because I was doing so at the doors. I was doing so on the phones. I never once felt like it was um, like I had to play a position. I always felt that if I was just myself and was able to connect to people that way, that we make moves that way. And it proved to be successful. It, we didn't just win the election when I became the commissioner for District 4. We won it by a huge margin. It wasn't a close victory. It was a, it was, it was a, it was a quite, it was a double digit margin. And I attribute that one to the incredible team that I have, but two, to really speaking and talking with and spending time at the doors. You know, uh, one of the things that I that I'll say before before I uh, before we move on is is that um, you know we always had this thing that you spend so much time on the doors you move on to the next neighbor. But no, no, no. For me, it was if we're having a conversation about what this person cares about what this person feels is significant change in policy that's needed. Oh, we're going to have a conversation. And that might that conversation might be 15, 20 minutes, half an hour long. But the important thing to me is that I'm hearing from, uh, you know, my neighbors, my community members, people who have a say, people who have lived experience and who are also experts. Because I feel like those people who have the lived experiences and all the issues we talk about, those are the experts that we listen to that can help uh, shift policy. So it is always a, 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 an honor and a privilege to represent uh, the you know, this area of South Minneapolis on the county board, it's always a privilege understanding that I am just the first Black woman to enter this arena, but certainly not the last. And I'll make it my duty that before I ever retire, there's another Black woman waiting in the wings to take this over. So uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. That is fantastic. <laughs> yeah. So Dr. Johnson, who went to Fisk? in the late 1940s. And what I know what so many listeners want to hear is what organizing was like in your youth and what we can learn from that. You know, um, I thank you very much, Dr. Harris, for the introduction and the reminder. But do you realize what it means to me, an elder, who has been able this day, and I thank God for it, to hear my young people express in a way the truth, hope, history of us as a people. For me, as a black older woman, to be able to hear our two young people say everything their ancestors have said for generations and to say it with such meaning and such a deep sense of commitment to your ancestors, what that group of people attempted to teach us who were brought here in slave cars, dying on their way, working daily, hourly in the plantation for us and having the strength of our community to tell that story, for them to live on and encourage you to give us the story you've given us today. I am so moved 
and so deeply honored to have lived long enough to hear your young voices and to hear Dr. Harris, who has moved from one position to another in the academy and to model what it means to be a well-educated spokesperson for not only the history that she not only knows, but has written and contributed to, who is proud to share the story of her family and encourage other young people as you have today to tell the story of your people, your family, that history. And I can't, you know, I was just thinking, what a blessing. So for me to have lived from the 40s, born in 1930, with parents who had gone to college, completed their undergraduate work, a father who wanted to go to law school. There were no law schools for black students. For a mother who graduated in the field of social science and opened a school for young children to assist parents in learning to be parents and teaching their children, to be able to watch that development as a young person and believing it is so natural. I don't remember my parents trying to sit me down and teach me something. They lived it. We saw it. My brothers and I saw our parents live the dream of our ancestors. Going off to college, one of our historic institutions, the first Fisk University, inviting the kind of people that you read about young people, they are there modeling for us the art of teaching, listening, and sharing to be able to grow up in an environment of just pride. Pride, seeing it, hearing it, talking to our ancestors. I can't tell you what that meant without us realizing what we were getting. That was a part of your environment. It was a part of your expectations. You were then given the environment, the room, the encouragement to be the best you could be. And there was nothing in my experience that made me feel I was different, better than, less than. To be in an environment with people like W.E.B. Du Bois, seeing him, not really knowing <laughs> that until later that you're looking at your history and being taught from the chapel and Friday convocations, people who are historic, who have brought to us not only the value of literature, art, music, love of each other, sharing. So having had an opportunity to grow up in that kind of environment, and, and believing that it is just natural. That's who we are, and that's what we do. And to have that opportunity to then continue as we grow older, 
as I grow older, to be able to see the product of you three young women who live up to, in every way, what I now, as your elder, realize was something you don't even know, but you've lived in an environment of support and love and belief and history and pride in being an African-American. I bless you, thank you for living up to what we knew we are. It almost brings, as one of you said, tears to my eyes to think about where you are and what you are telling your younger generation. Mm -hmm. And for me to live long enough to see my younger generation live up to what we, your ancestors, had hoped. So I'm delighted, happy. I can't tell you, Duchess, how happy I am to have been invited here today. And well, I, it means so much. Well, I think I speak for Anika and Angela when I say that our hearts are filled. And as we watch history unfold, all of us on this panel, but most of us in the world, saw history unfold in the recent presidential election. And there are two Black women I want to talk about. And the first Black woman that I want to talk about um, in terms of knowing her worth and being a change maker would be none other than Stacey Abrams. So Stacey Abrams, as a leader on voter suppression, I would like Anika and Angela to talk about what we have learned from her and what the significance is of her leadership. Yes. And I me, do you want me, Anika? <laughs> you know, I have the, the uh, first of all, I am just extremely humbled right now. But also I had the extreme privilege of, of being able to meet Stacey Abrams when she came to Minnesota to speak at the DFL dinner. Uh, maybe it was a DFL dinner, but it was last year sometime mm -hmm. pre-COVID. And what a remarkable human being. What a remarkable human being. I have to say that it has been nothing but Black women who have motivated me, who have inspired me, who have pushed me to do more. So when I am in the presence of the likes of Stacey Abrams, to me, I am listening, I am learning, and I am mentally calculating, taking notes. This woman is fierce. She is bad. She <laughs> is, listen, uh, and it, it's about where does our power lie? So we all watched her gubernatorial campaign. We all said she, the can't, this seat was stolen from her. But what did she do in that moment? Was she seized on an opportunity to make sure that voters' voices were heard? We're not just talking about the average voter. We're talking about voters who have systemically, historically been shut out of the process. We're talking about Black voters. Let's, let's just be real. And so the fact that what we saw in this election was happening in Georgia right now unequivocally, is the result of the powerhouse that is Stacey Abrams, is the result of the movement and the push to say, you know what, we've seen what voter suppression does to election results, and we're not, we're, we're not taking that no more. We're not going to take that no more. And then move into action and, and move into uh, a, a mindset that is oriented around the equality of, of the right to vote. Like, it's just that simple. We all have the right to vote. And suppressing that right to vote is illegal. And it's going to take organizing to get around that because the system, uh, the GOP, I'll be frank, 
the system, the way that it was designed, it was not designed to support our Black right to vote. So to be in the presence of someone like Stacey Abrams talking about what it's like to organize just really reminded me too of, you know, how important it is to organize. One of the things that I will always credit my election win to is the organization of the people. Organized people beat organized money every single time. And when you organize those boots on the ground, you can do, you can move mountains. And that's exactly what Stacey Abrams did. And so, um, so I, I just, I look at that and I, I just am in awe, but I'm also like any time that we need to push against this ridiculous machine that keeps us oppressed, we have to organize. So for me, Stacey Abrams looks like the example. She looks like the epitome of what organized black people can do uh, when we, when we need to make su substantial change. Good. Anika, what say you? Yes, well, I knew Commissioner Conley was gonna tee it up and like Stacey Abrams is just my superwoman. You know, she is definitely my superwoman when it comes to who is the woman who literally saved democracy. We always have heard the narrative of the strong black woman, but Stacey Abrams was beyond strength, right? She was strength that had that was habitual, right? Everyone saw power within themselves and was mobilizing, even in a situation where they were cast out or locked out or blocked out of our democracy. They still believed and they still hold fast, held fast to that. Also, I think what's really important with Stacey Abrams is that it really woke up. Uh, our democracy from this post-racial slumber that folks were in, right? When um, Obama's presidency, uh, we were, you know, you know, the liberals, moderates, progressives of like we have transcend racism, and uh, we took the hands off the wheel when it came to to voting rights, right? Um, we were had the privilege and the honor to really live in the legacy of Cong Congress um, man John Lewis who fought for voting rights. So many people, as we already know, who fought for voting rights. And uh, we thought that was a mantle that we had to put down. But no, we had, Stacey Abrams had to pick that. Oh, what happened? What happened? Oh, I'm sorry, y'all, someone was calling oh, me. Okay. But, uh, okay. Make sure, I do, do not disturb. Do not disturb our votes. Do not disturb our <laughs> democracy, you know? Um, but we really, uh, Stacey Abrams, I was very inspired by her, her run because as someone who also ran for St. Paul City Council and came less than 300 votes, um, of winning that seat without the DFL endorsement, without any labor union endorsements, just only women endorsements and, um, the, um, out front endorsements. Right. And I had that. Um, opportunity what Stacey Abram has said at the DFL dinner where you know you build a luxury hotel and a resort on the island of despair right it were of the island of disappointment where you give up and I had that opportunity to walk into despair but I chose to walk into what our ancestors walked into and what Harriet Tubman was running towards right was hope was liberty, was liberation, was that we can change. There is transformation that is possible through us. And that is us continuing to show up, not only just, just for the vote, but there's opportunities to show up at the Capitol. There's opportunities to show up at the hearings. There's opportunities to show up for even Black folks who are in office or anyone who's in office and build those relationships to make change. And that you don't have to sit in a position of power as a, as a politician to make change, that there is a plethora of opportunities and um, legacies to be made when you are working with the people. And I'll just share this. Uh, prior to uh, when I was doing GOTV, we were doing voter registration and um, getting out the vote and everything. Uh, I had an opportunity to meet a man who was 86 years old. And I asked him, I and mean, I kind of figured that this was a, a man, African American man, who you know would would understand the power of the vote, right? I asked him, I was like, hey, you know, are you registered to vote? And he told me, I'm not able to vote. 
And I had asked him, I was like, well, are you, we know here in Minnesota, uh, we restrict people's voting rights if they're on felony probation or parole. So I assumed it was that. And I asked him, I was like, well, how long have you, are you on probation or parole? He's like, well, I'm not on probation or parole. He was like, I, back in his time, when he um, you know, was convicted, he was told that he would never be able to vote, right? So we have that, uh, it's very unclear in Minnesota's voting rights laws of who gets to vote. And I was able to clarify to him that, sir, that if you are off probation or parole, you have the right to vote. You served your time. Find out he served his sentence 25 years ago. Wow. He has not been able to vote because no one had told him that he was even eligible, right? No one had told him that his vote matters. No one had even reached out into his community. So there is even here in Minnesota being one of the top um, voter percentages in the entire nation, we still have so many people that need to be brought into our democracy who have been left out due to the modern day Jim Crow laws that we yes. still see today. Yes. And let me just add a little bit to this. Do we have time? Definitely. And then um, we're going to shift gears. All right. What I want, what I'd like to share with my young people is what went even before uh, our current worker in Georgia. Black women, I just don't want you to forget from whence you've come, but when you look at people who were right here in Minnesota, Black women, Nellie Stone Johnson, if you don't know that name, I want you to look it up. If you don't know the name of Emily Reed, I want you to look it up. I want you to know that you come from a tradition of Black women being engaged, committed, and continuous in the struggle. Black women and what we are so grateful for is to have the kind of work that we've seen. You've lived long enough to actually see it and to be models for other young Black women. Women have been historically engaged in the struggle for freedom and justice, and they have often been the last ones to be acknowledged that they've been engaged. I'm so proud of you all and to hear you talk about black women because they are all around you. When you look at, at uh, Dr. Harris, when you look at the other black women who are still out there in our community, modeling for us strength, determination, knowledge of the struggle of us as a people. So thank you. I've been reading uh, so much about women, and so have you. We just keep on keeping on, my friends, reading about us, writing about us, telling our story. Well, ladies, um, you know, fan, right, fan snaps. <laughs> um, it is already 1.40. We have questions coming in from the audience, and I want to remind audience members so please um, type your questions in. Before we get to the audience, however, this will just be our um, closing question. Um, when we talk about celebrating dynamic black women, we have to have a discussion about Vice President-elect Kamala Harris. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and so we can start with you, Dr. Johnson, and close out with Angela and Anika and then bring the audience in. Well, you know, it is so wonderful because I've had an opportunity, like many of you, to meet her, to watch her, to see what she has done, and to know the potential. That's who we are. I can't tell you how proud I was, as you are, of her being willing to face that struggle. Can you imagine this 90-year-old elder 
lived long enough to see the first black president, Barack Obama, then lived long enough to see the first black vice president and how, how blessed I feel. It means a lot. And we have to remember what it means to have that kind of image before us. Mm -hmm. And my great granddaughter, Josie Six, who is going to grow up in an environment of Black women who are proud of who they are and continue to model what our ancestors have taught us. So thank you. Thank you. It was such a joy and a belief to see her confirmed as this. And we must remember, let's watch, let the crazy people right now who are trying to change all of this, let's don't let them do it, my sisters. We've got lots of work yet to do. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, with the, the, the results of having a first Black woman as a vice president, Kamala Harris, it's really breaking the glass ceilings that, you know, uh, women um, and Black women and so all women have experience, right, of that narrative that uh, you are not electable, you are not fit for leadership. Um, breaking down that narrative, it was very uh, just symbolic and also I felt like spiritual in a sense that we are breaking down some some barriers to begin um, conversations. Um, I you know get great inspiration from the the legendary activist Angela Davis, right who during that time a lot of um, conversations was happening around where 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 is the moral compass going for what's going to continue on our our advocacy right and um our work that we're doing and angela davis even uh articulating you know how we can leverage conversations who do you want to have a conversation with and i think what a presidency of uh president joe biden and kamala harris opens up the conversations for us to see policies procedures and uh, change, you know, that has not have happened, um, you know, for Black women and for, and you know, what works for Black women also works for everybody, right? We have been the creators of civilization and um, in social services and, and, and uh, institution builders, expanders, and have entered, you know, I can even tip my hat off to Dr. Josie Johnson, who I had the honor of reading your book and just was so humbled in tears of just like the magnitude of your 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 commitment at the University of Minnesota in like literally building out African American studies that did not exist before you, right? So I think with a uh, presidency with a black woman in that and black woman and Asian woman in that seat is going to enter a uh, politics of black women that we have not seen ever in our lifetime and i feel like we are now positioned in a in a space to where we can walk in that power we can walk in that leadership and that we um also are walking in the movement of protecting black women right we know there's been a lot of social commentary around uh how have black women been protecting how we have not we understand the bodies of black women and intellectual properties of black women have all been utilized um to others advantage right but now we are in a situation where we um you know have the opportunity to stand on the shoulders of our uh, dr josie johnson's of our um, ida b wells of our so many katie mcwatts here of so many legendary um, Black women who are still here and present and reminding us that we are winning, right? And we are walking in that faith and we are walking and breaking down more glass ceilings and um, also concrete ceilings as well. Well, I think I'll just, I'll just chime in with, you know, my, my youngest child is seven, will be seven very soon. And, you know, we watched, uh, you know the the um, the speech, the acceptance speech, if you will, 
uh, on on election night. And my seven year old son looked at me, who uh, he has autism. He looked at me and he said, "Her skin is like mine." I said, it is. Does that mean you could be vice president? And he's like, yeah. And it reminded me of the conversation I had with my oldest two. So my oldest two children are 20 and 21. So they were around for the first Obama presidency. And we went to, I think, uh, Barack Obama and Michelle came here to like the, uh, the Target Center or wherever it was. And I, I, they, it was just this moment that you can't really put into words, but it was this moment of representation. It was this moment of like, whoa, we're living history right now. And like, guess what? This, this guy is about to be the president of the United States and he kind of looks like you, you know? And it, so it was, it was just amazing, but it really goes to show that uh, you know, fast forward to your mom is running for office and your mom might make history if she wins. There was always, and it, it's it's so humbling to me because it was, it was always just this opportunity to not only teach my children about the various different levels of government, right? But also to teach my children that these various different levels of government are open to you. They are open to you. And so Barack Obama was the first in our lifetime. Kamala Harris is, is the second, the first also in her own right, in our lifetimes. And I want my children to know that no matter what, if, if it's local government, if it's national government, no matter what it is, you have a door that you can enter because someone smashed the heck out of that door and opened it up, smashed the heck out of those ceilings. Uh, and, and so the door is open. Let's run right through it. Uh, and so for me, it really is just personally like, you know, thank you. Uh, that it's a, it's a huge thank you. And it's also like, I want our children to see this as opportunity, see this as like, this is not something that's exclusive to a certain club. This is something that I have access to because as my seven-year-old will tell you, the vice president looks like me. And that makes, a, th that, that's, that's huge. That's huge. So I know we don't have much time left. So I just want to leave with that. I live like, I live through my children and when they light up because they see something that is, is representative of them, I light up because I know that the possibilities for them are endless. Oh my gosh. How, how inspiring. Yeah. Um, we're going to take our first question from an audience member. And that question is, um, what do you wish more people knew about the challenges you face pursuing justice and liberation in the roles that you have? And that question is from Megan Casey. So thank you for that, Megan. I'll go. Uh, thank you, Megan. Hey, Megan. <laughs> Uh, people should know that this world often is lonely. It's lonely in that there is so much work to do. Uh, Anika, you can attest to this. Uh, Dr. Johnson, you can attest to this. It gets lonely because the fight is not an easy fight. It is a difficult fight. When I became the the, the uh, county commissioner for District 4, when I became the first black Hennepin County commissioner, okay, I was up against 160 plus years of oppression and mass incarceration and institutionalized racism and internalized racism. And I am an activist. I come from the background of shutting down freeways and showing up at city council with a hundred people behind me. I am an activist, I am an advocate. I am someone who looks out for people first and bring a people's agenda to this work. And so it's, I, I want people to know, it is taxing when black women are strong. We talked about Stacey Abrams earlier. When black women are strong and we are leading and we are fighting, also know we're still fragile uh, in some instances. We, we still need supports and we still need to be looked out for. So we, we're we doing this work and it's work that we wanna do and we're fighting to do the right thing. And, and folks want us to do that and support us in doing that. But please know that we also uh, need support in this. And it's never a bad idea to say, uh, Anika, what do you need today? What have, have you drank your water today? It's, it's not a bad idea, Dr. Johnson. 
have you have you had lunch today? Mm-hmm. It's not a bad idea to just check in mm-hmm. with your black women mm-hmm. friends mm-hmm. who are fighting this good fight and making sure we're eating, we're ha- we're drinking our water, we're maybe getting outside to get some fresh air. I don't know about who all is watching, but in Minneapolis right now it's 40 degrees and that's great for November. <laughs> Uh, so check in on us because a lot of us aren't aren't okay, and it's okay to not be okay. I want to be very clear about that. Uh, so I'll, so I'll I'll stop there. But I just please just check in on us. We fight. We we put up a, a good fight every day, but often we we just just a quick okay. How you doing? Is is really a good idea. And for me. Um... The idea of our people being engaged and remembering the struggle for justice and liberation, I think the results and success of you young people is suggesting to our young people that it's possible. One of the things that we must remember People need to feel some success. They need to feel that that struggle leads to some kind of justice and liberation. So when you are successful, that opens the door for other young people, young women, to see the possibility of justice and liberation. My friends, show them, keep what you do. Keep your struggle in front of us because it's helpful for the young people to hear you listening to your ideas and your wishes is what keeps your elders and the history going. So thank you. Keep it up. Justice and liberation are critical and you are the the backbone and the spirit of that. So Keep well, it. we learned we learned it from you, Doctor. Yes. Well, yeah, I learned it from Wait. your parents and your <laughs> grandparents. Yes. I'll just be really brief. I just think about the the quote from Zora Neale Hurston: "No, if you are silent in your oppression, they'll kill you." And said you enjoyed it, right? right. And for me, it's we can never be silent in our oppression. And actually, we that is where we really get our power and our leadership is pushing back from that oppression, right? And pushing forward into what's actually liberating us, what is making us hopeful, what is um, generating, you know, wealth, what is generating love, what is generating community, how are we building it together? And I think it's very important that, um, you know, as an activist, right, and a freedom fighter, um, that I'm not fighting to become what I hate, right? I am fighting to be Become what I'm dreaming, and like Harriet Tubman, like every dream begins. With, every dreamer begins with a dream, right? And we have to continue as we are pushing back from oppression, but we are dreaming and creating and visualizing into this world that we want to live in, that we all deserve to live in, because we have paid the price with our power, strength, and sweat equity, you know, to the democracy and to just the greater good of our people and everyone, right? And everyone benefits from that. So I just think about just uh, not being silent, you know, for many of those who feel like they have to act or fit in a certain type of role, say a certain type of thing, um, to break free of that struggle and, um, you know, speak up, you know, speak up in ways boldly and build community as you speak up. Wow. Well, I, I could do this all afternoon. Same. <laughs> but as, right, but a, as the moderator, I will say that this will probably be our final question. Um, but it's, um, it's really uh, a, a really question that um, is important in the state of Minnesota. And the question is, what do we feel the plans can be, um, how we can reach out to further engage our black brothers and sisters in rural Minnesota so they know some of the dynamic black history in our state and our movement? And this question is from Shaniqua Johnson. Hey, Shaniqua. Hey, Shaniqua. Our city, um, city council member, Shaniqua. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Which city? 
Oh my gosh, I don't know. She would have to share. <laughs> Wait, city council? What? Yeah, really? that's exciting. I'll, I'll just say, say put in the chat. And just, she's it, been at it a long time, my friend. A yes. very long time, Dr. Johnson, for sure. <laughs> Let me just say, uh, I have so much respect for Shaniqua. I will also say that that is such a good point. Uh, I have friends who live in other states and they joke with me, right? For years, people have joked with me about there's black people in Minnesota. Yes, there are, quite frankly. <laughs> and, and, and guess what? There's black people throughout Minnesota. So if we're not just in Minneapolis, we're not just in the Metro, we're in Worthington, we're in Bemidji, we're in Fergus Falls, we're in Moorhead. And so uh, that's why I, I personally think that a black agenda is so important to unify the needs of black Minnesotans from around the state. We are everywhere here. We are everywhere here. And in fact, you know, I've learned that recently you have more black people moving out into uh, out state, if you will, Minnesota to buy land, to build, you know, farming communities. There's a, a black women's farming cooperative in, in northern Minnesota. But um, I think that we have to be cognizant of the fact that not only have we been here, uh, but we've also moved outside of just the metro into areas where we should always uh, strive to stay connected for what it is that that is our shared agenda. I won't forget that the first time I met uh, Shaniqua Johnson was talking about her campaign and talking about mine and really identifying what those similarities were to, you know, there's people experiencing food security on the south side of Minneapolis that I represent outside my front door, just like there are people experiencing food insecurity in Worthington, Minnesota. So it, it, it goes beyond these boundaries and these, you know, these, uh, these lines. It goes beyond all of that. And it's what is our collective need, our collective agenda? Let's get that on paper and let's push policy towards um, solutions for Black communities throughout the state of Minnesota. So I think that's a great question. And it, it's, uh, we, we, we've heard a lot about this urban-rural divide, and really it's non-existent. The same issues that folks face uh, in terms of food shortages and, and whatever other uh, thing you can come up with in outstate Minnesota are some of the same issues that we face right here in the middle of the, the heart of the south side of Minneapolis. So I think that it is a collective um, endeavor that we come together around our shared challenges to create shared opportunities. Mm -hmm. I think that's just a really dynamic <clears throat> question as well. And I think there's definitely a need to have um, and to learn more history, Black history, especially in rural Minnesota and outer parts. Um, you know, I had the uh, the fortune to learn about, you know, some of the Black inventors that invented the refrigerator right here in Minnesota to where um, the first Black person was a uh, major here in Minnesota. Um, oh my gosh, I don't want to butcher his name, but uh, was a fur trader, right? Invented and revolutionized the fur trade. And uh, there's so many um, Black folks in who are farmers who really, is, we talk about the labor movement and um, how the creation of DFL um, came about, you know, first starting as a democratic movement, um, or excuse me, party, and then getting farmer and labor was revolutionized through Nellie Stone Johnson, right? Black women who were organizers, even, you know, outside of the cities. So there is um, definitely a need for that history to be taught in our schools so we um, can see ourselves existing outside of just, you know, the, the, the inner cities. Um, and also, I just want to say thank you, Commissioner Conley. I feel like you gifted me my Christmas gift already with like even speaking to a black agenda. That's one of those like elephants in the rooms when it comes to black um, folks and yes. politics. So we're like, wait, yes. do a black agenda exist? Like, is this like a myth of like, we can't have a black mm -hmm. agenda? And I just want to say thank you for even breaking through with, you know, creating that conversation and inserting that in this discussion, because that's what we definitely need to look into or move forward towards. The organizing power is there and um, the need is there. We will not um, be able to move forward without having that, you know, really integrated in how we see ourselves in policy and um, policy change as well. So I'll just keep it short. I love Shaniqua Johnson. So glad she's tuning in. And I'm definitely at that table to have those conversations as well. 
Absolutely. Lady, I, I cannot believe that this is coming to an end. Um, audience members, you are joining me with Black women change makers that I am honored to be sharing space with. This is Anika Bowie, who is the vice president of the Minneapolis NAACP. Give us a wave so hey. people know who you are, Anika. Okay, we also have Angela Conley, who is a commissioner for Hennepin County. Okay. And then, of course, we all stand on the shoulders of Dr. Josie R. Johnson, who is our elder at 90 years young, who has done more in the last hour than many of us have done in our lifetime. My name is Duchess Harris. I am a professor of American Studies and Political Science at McAllister College. I'm also a curator of the Duchess Harris Collection, which has 130 books for fourth to 12th graders addressing social justice, my new book on justice for George Floyd will be available next month. I hope everyone has a wonderful afternoon. Do take care. Thank you so much, Dr. Harris. Thank you so much.